Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this Moodle Academy webinar on creating Tani and C plugins. <clears throat> and my name is Rajnil Totara. I'm a developer educator at uh, Moodle Academy. Uh, I'm based in the Fiji Islands and uh, we've got uh, two very uh, interesting speakers today. Uh, we are joined by Andrew Lyons uh, from the Moodle HQ team. Uh, Andrew is the principal architect for Moodle LMS. And also joining us is Marina Shogosh, who is part of the Tiny MCE team. Uh, Marina is the developer relations manager at Tiny MCE. And both Andrew and um, Marina will talk to us about how we can create Tiny MCE plugins for Moodle. Uh, so we are very excited to have both of them uh, joining us in our Moodle Academy webinar. Uh, and with these words, uh, it's over to you, Andrew. Hi there, everybody. Um, thanks for that introduction, uh, um, Rajneel. As Rajneel says, I'm Andrew Lyons. I'm the Principal Architect for Moodle LMS. And in today's webinar, I will be covering the Moodle side of tiny plugin development, specifically what you need to know to get started with plugin development in Moodle, the tiny versions that we use in Moodle and our version support commitment, the anatomy of a Moodle plugin, a tiny plugin in Moodle, configuration of tiny and your plugin, the Moodle approach to translation of tiny plugins, how to build your plugin and access control. Both Moodle and Tiny MCE have very good developer documentation to assist in creating plugins. And where possible, I will leave references to the relevant documentation on screen throughout this webinar. Um, this is the, uh, the path to both of those documentation sites. Um, I will have a slide at the end of my presentation with these as well. Um, Getting started with Moodle development is uh, always fun, and there are many ways to set up your Moodle development environment, and your options depend on the operating system you use and your personal preferences. Essentially, though, you need to have a recent version of PHP, a web server such as Apache or Nginx, and a relational database such as Postgres, MariaDB, MS SQL Server, or MySQL. You would also need to have Moodle installed with Moodle debugging enabled, and most developers choose to use Git for their version control and to make use of an IDE such as VS Code or PHP Storm. For Tiny MCE plugin development, you will also need to have Node.js installed with the Node Package Manager. Uh, you can check out our Getting Started Moodle Developer Docs page as well for more information on those. When integrating Moodle with third-party software, we have a policy of stability within each release. Uh, the version of Tiny MCE that was originally included with a specific version of Moodle does not change throughout the lifetime of that Moodle release, and we typically upgrade to the latest version of Tiny a short while before each Moodle release. So Moodle 4.1 included Tiny MCE 6.2, Moodle 4.3 included 6.6.2, and so on. Um, and at this point, uh, Moodle 5.0, which is the version we're currently working on, will have Tiny MCE 7.0. Five, I think is about to be released. Uh, I think I got the changelog notes this morning. On the whole, the Tiny MCE API is very stable and breaking changes are really rare, but it's always worth looking over the Tiny changelogs when preparing your Moodle plugin for a new version of Moodle and Tiny MCE. One of the easiest ways to quickly generate a Tiny MCE plugin for Moodle is to use the plugin skeleton generator. However, in this webinar, we're going to create a pl our plugin step by step, explaining some of the features as we go. Uh, the tiny plugin, sorry, the, MC, the Moodle plugin skeleton generator is available in the Moodle plugins database, and you can search for the plugin scale, I think is the name of the plugin. For the purposes of this webinar, I'm going to describe a new fictional plugin named Inspiration, whose purpose is to provide inspirational quotes and to insert them into your content. If you want to follow along at home, you can check out the repository. There's a QR code on the bottom left of the screen and the uh, URL on the bottom right for the next few slides. All Tiny MT plugins in Moodle are stored in the lib editor tiny plugins folder. They all have the plugin type of tiny. And in this example, the plugin, the plugin has a machine read plugin name of inspiration. Typically in Moodle, we will combine the plugin type and the name together into what is known as the Frankenstar name. 
In this case, the Frankenstein name is tiny underscore inspiration. The plugin's visible name comes from its language files, and in this case, it is inspiration. Related for other languages as you need. A Moodle TinyMC plugin is much like any other Moodle plugin with just a handful of additional files. Every Moodle plugin must have, as a minimum, a version.php file, a language file, and a privacy provider. The version.php file describes the plugin's version and release, the Moodle version that it requires, and any dependencies on other Moodle plugins it has, as well as the stability of that plugin. In this example, our tiny inspiration plugin will work with all versions of Moodle from 4.1 upwards. The dependencies on mod forum and mod data are just examples for, for this demonstration. This plugin doesn't actually depend on those, um, those uh, plugins. Language files are always located in the lang directory of your plugin, and the English translation is always required. That's located in the en folder. For community plugins, other languages may also be provided if you wish, or they can often be downloaded from the uh, translation site. Language files in Moodle are a PHP file, which, which contain an array called dollar $string, which contains a mapping of keys and their translations. For tiny MCE plugins, as a minimum, you need to provide a plugin name and any strings required for the privacy API. All Moodle plugins should also include an implementation of the Moodle Privacy API. For most tiny MCE plugins in Moodle, we don't collect any data, and the plugin just needs to declare that it doesn't collect anything. In this case, the plugin can implement a privacy provider, which implements the null provider, which means it does not store personal information, and it provides, a, and you need to provide a string which explains this to the user. Where your plugin does collect personal data or, or it's transmitted in any way, you should consult the documentation, uh, which is just located down here, uh, for information on how best to describe this data. For Moodle Tiny MCE plugins, there are two additional files that you must also provide. We need to have an AMD source plugin.js file, which contains the JavaScript implementation of the plugin, and a pluginfo.php file, which provides information about the plugin and allows for configuration to be passed around. The plugin info class is used as a container to describe and configure the plugin. It is in our tiny inspiration namespace, and it has a plugin. It has a class name of plugin info. It also extends the editor underscore tiny slash plugin class. In this case, our plugin currently has no configuration, and it doesn't need to override any methods of the parent class. So the class is currently empty, but it is still required. We'll be adding some settings to this class later on. The plugin.js file is where the real work happens in our plugin. It is responsible for declaring your plugin to the TinyMCE API, defining any user interface components, and the user workflow itself. This implementation this implementation contains the bare minimum to register the plugin with Moodle and have it executed by TinyMCE once the editor loads. To make our code more readable and easier to work with, we often move commonly used variables into other modules. In this case, we've, mo we've moved the definition of the plugin name at the top here and the configuration option, uh, method here into a common.js file for the plugin name and a configuration.js file for the configuration, which is down here. Uh, that's something we strongly recommend, and there are other files which we will create as we go. At the top of the file, we import a helper method, get tinyMCE, from the Moodle API. This is from our loader. This method fetches the tinyMCE global API from Moodle. Our plugin module uh, must have a default export uh, containing a new ECMAScript promise, which is just defined here. And inside that promise, we have uh, we call the helper method to get the TinyMC API, and then we register the plugin with TinyMC later. Finally, at the bottom, we resolve our plugin using the resolve method. Everything within the TinyMC plugin manager.add method relates to the TinyMC API and is called once for each instance of a TinyMC editor on a page. Most of the Tiny API that we need to interact with only accept resolved values. That is, we cannot make this method asynchronous or provide unresolved promises in most of the API. 
And for that reason, everything else is called during the initial setup of the TinyMCE editor before any of the editor instances have been created. This bit is only called once, and we are able to resolve asynchronous calls here. So for example, we have this promise.all uh, where we fetch the TinyMCE uh, API, but we can add other things which may fetch strings or templates. At this point, we now have a, a new skeleton plugin, but it doesn't yet have any user interface components defined, and it doesn't actually do anything. We need to define UI components are used. Marina is going to be going over most of this, but I'll just talk about the, the Moodle side of this. So to set up the uh, tinymc commands, we have added an import for a new get setup commands method, which we use to perform any asynchronous parts of the setup. This returns a uh, get setup method, which is called synchronously for each instance of the editor. Again, this may seem a little complex at first, but it is required because the TinyMC plugin manager is not designed to work with those asynchronous requests or, to, or any unresolved promises. Anytime we need to fetch those strings, render templates, process a web request, or work with any other unresolved promise, uh, we must do so here uh, before we work with the plugin manager. Here we have that get setup commands method where we fetch a string and an image, we render a template to generate an SV image SVG image for the button. This method, the method it returns here uh, is returned once the dependencies here have been resolved and becomes our new setup methods in the previous slide. The editor parameter here is the editor instance being initialized. At this point, we have defined our plugin and we've defined the buttons and their behaviors. And our final step is to configure where in the tiny MCE user interface they appear. The configure method we have defined here. This is our configuration.js file. Uh, our configure method uh, is called during the initialization of each tiny MCE editor instance. The current editor configuration is passed in, in as the instance config parameter. Any options you wish to change can be set in the configure method and are passed out as an object, which is merged together. Moodle provides a number of helpers to make this configuration easier. In this case, we're using the add menu bar item helper. And this takes the current menu bar configuration from instance config menu, and it's adding a, a menu button, uh, which we're getting from the button name from our common.js file. Uh, that actually has a value of tiny un underscore inspiration slash inspire me. That's our button name. And it's inserting it at the end of the insert menu. We also have helpers available for adding and removing items from the menu bar and from toolbars and from submenu items and for adding context menu items and for adding dynamic tool menu toolbar items. And you can also modify the configuration any other way you like, as this is just a standard JavaScript object. Normally in TinyMCE, all strings are written in English and are translated based on the English language string itself. For example, uh, in the Moodleified example we have here, we have a new menu item whose text is add inspirational quote, and you can see that just here in bold. In the standard TinyMCE ecosystem, if a translator wishes to translate the string, then they would normally use this add inspirational quote string as a key for their translation. And this is a really common approach to translation, but it does have a number of limitations, which means that it is not suitable for Moodle. For example, any change in the casings, for example, to make it capitalize the I or the Q in this uh, would break the translation. Likewise, any typos which were fixed or, and more importantly, the, this, there's no ability to have context specific translations. Instead, Moodle uses a language string identifier, such as button title, which we're using here. This allows us to have the same English language string translate to different values in different situations in Moodle, which is a feature that we use across Moodle very frequently. It also means that it is possible to create grammar, spelling, and casing without breaking the translation itself. Because of the way in which the Moodle translation system works though, we must fetch those translated strings during the initial set of the plugin so that we can use it later on. The translation of the button title is generated using the, the getString API, and the value, which is add inspirational quote, is assigned to the button text variable up here. And finally, it is then able to be used uh, after the asynchronous call has been resolved in our uh, new setup commands method as the button text for this string, uh, for, the, for this text. 
Now we've created our uh, menu. Uh, this is the uh, menu item that we've created. It's at the bottom of the insert menu. Uh, it has the text which came from that um, language string and we have a, a, an SVG icon that's been rendered. And by using it, we can actually insert that content. As with most JavaScript projects, Moodle requires that the plugin code be built or in our case, transpiled. And we currently use Grunt for this. We generally recommend using the Node version manager tooling to install the correct version of Node.js for each version of Moodle. And after selecting the correct version of Node.js, all of Moodle's JS dependencies can be installed using NPM CI. After installing these dependencies, we gen generally recommend using the Node.js NPX tooling to run Grunt. You can build all of your JS files using the NPX Grunt AMD command. This is generally the approach that we recommend for Moodle development. Moodle also has a really fine-grained roles and capability system and allows plugins to define their own capabilities with defaults. It allow also allows administrators to set which user roles hold those capabilities. In our fictional scenario, the spec we've had from our client mentions that they want to restrict access of this feature to teachers and content creators only. To do so, we create an entry in our plugins db slash access.php file. We also have to create an entry in our plugins language file, which describes the for administrators what that, um, what that capability does. And finally, we can then override the is enabled method in our plugin info class. This is one of the methods which is defined in the parent class. In this case, all we need to do is uh, check whether the current user has the tiny slash inspiration inspire capability that we defined um, in the current context. So whether they're a teacher in the current course or whether they're not. Uh, and that would determine whether they have access to use this, um, this plugin. As a developer, you will often also want to pass configuration between Moodle and Tiny. This might be user preferences, site configuration options, uh, and possibly even API keys. Thankfully, this is a relatively easy task in most cases. Back in our plugin info class, uh, we need to declare that our plugin has configuration. And we do so by implementing the plugin with configuration interface. On the Tiny side, we must register these values as options where we choose to provide any validation and defaults and so on. We do that here with register option. It's also important to note that you must use the get plugin option name uh, method when registering the option and for any getters and setters. So here we're using it, we're using get plugin option name with fetch count, which matches the value returned from our plugin info. Um, and that uses the plugin name as well. Uh, that's about found in our options uh, module for TinyMCE. We use that uh, name here when registering the option, and we can also use it here when fetching it in our getter. Uh, this ensures that the name of the argument is correctly picked up from our incoming configuration because we uh, modify this to allow for uh, different plugins to have to share the same same option names. And finally, uh, we just need to call our new register options uh, method in our plugin.js file. So this is back in our AMD source plugin.js. We have our register options, and we call that inside our tiny MCE plugin manager.add method, passing in that editor instance again. So I'll now hand over to Marina to talk about the tiny side of plugin creation. Over to you, Marina. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. Um, certainly going to try to follow that up. So today, um, the rest of this webinar, what I'm really going to be talking about is um, TinyMCE. Well, I'm right now from TinyMCE DevRel, so TinyMCE. Auto going to be addressing a little bit um, for folks who have been on Auto before um, and are wondering what is the differences, things like that, provide you with some resources, um, as well as TinyMCE plugins. Uh, what are the different types of plugins out there? What are the different capabilities to expand beyond just a very simple rich text editor? Um, and then kind of quickly dive into what Andrew uh, just 
you know, beautifully dived into, which is the Tiny MCE plugin structure when it comes to Moodle. Example of creating yet another uh, Tiny MCE plugin, um, which I believe Rajneel has a step by step guide for you in the course. If you've not already checked it out, I'm sure we have a link um, somewhere. And then finally, um, why adding plugins to Tiny MCE is really important. So just going over that and the value of like buy versus build. All right. Hope you all stay for that. Um, so Tiny MCE, it's this little rich text editor over there. Most of you in Moodle probably have heard of it. I believe starting in Moodle 4.4, Tiny MCE is now the default rich text editor. So taking over from auto, um, it's pretty powerful, pretty user friendly, even developer friendly, I would say, in terms of formatting options that come right out of the box. Um, and what we're really going to talk about is um, how powerful and highly customizable it can be. So you can, as just demonstrated, create your own plugin very quickly and get it all set up within the TinyMC space um, using the editor API. But what you can also do is ensure um, that... Look, take a look at some of those premium plugins that are offered within Moodle to see if they fit your use case, um, depending on what your use case is. All right. And then as promised, um, let's talk a little bit about Auto. I believe it's been the Moodle default text editor since version 2.7. Um, and it's uh, been sort of replaced by Tiny. And um, what I would like to say is if you do, and I think a big problem in the developer community or a big sort of discussion point that we've seen is a lot of people, even at Moodle Moot, asking us about if they have an auto plugin, can they kind of transport it or just directly translate it um, into a tiny MCE plugin? And that's not necessarily the case. Um, so if you have an um, auto plugin at the moment, um, I believe the best way to go forward is to kind of create your own tiny MCE equivalent of that plugin um, and follow along those steps. So Auto to Tiny, what does that look like? Just a quick recap of what I just mentioned. Um, why move to Tiny? Well, I believe Auto is no longer maintained. Uh, we do offer a lot more features and we have active support for you. Um, and if you're still using Auto, you do need to migrate to Tiny MCE plugins to be able to start using it. And I believe Andrew here has uh, written a great piece um, on the replacement of Auto. So definitely use that as a link to check it out on why Auto is being replaced. Um, sweet. So let's move on to Tiny MCE plugins. Um, so as I mentioned, plugins, you don't have to build all of the plugins from scratch. They actually offer a suite of open source and premium plugins. Open source are free plugins that cover basic things like formatting, lists, links, and things like that. Um, I think it's pretty great for a strong editing foundation for your users. But if you're looking for some more advanced features, I think the premium plugins can actually take it up a notch. Um, there's actually several pre-built ones, and this is a list of a uh, few that I found that are compatible uh, and available in Moodle today, um, including some and I'll, I'm not going to go over each and every one of them, but some highlights, power paste. Um, we were actually talking about this right before the webinar. The, the One of the big problems is in content creation workflows, typically content creation starts in a Word document or a Google Docs. The ability to just import content as in copy and paste them is pretty incredible. And that's sort of what Power Paste is all about. Um, there's also advanced tables, which I know is big. The ability to have sort, um, almost like a Google Docs or Excel-like sorting and filtering in, within your rich text editor that that is really important. Um, image editing is, uh, is a great feature, of course, having images and visual content is almost a daily part of our content these days. And a few other things for an LMS solution, like table of table content, page embed, um, you know, accessibility checker, spell checker, and so on and so forth. All right. 
So let's kind of briefly recap and go back to where Andrew was talking about this sort of Moodle plugin structure, but also very specifically how this tiny MC plugin um, would look like. Um, as he mentioned, uh, tiny MC plugins are stored in this lib editor tiny plugins directory, where each plugin is going to have its own subdirectory. So, for example, um, this example has its own subdirectory named after the specific plugin, um, and with that said, um, we're going to specifically take a look at two files today, the common JS file and the command JS file, uh, commands JS file. So this is the commons JS file. The purpose of this is basically to store variables that might be used across the plugin, for example, the name of the plugin or the icon. Um, I think it just reduces code duplication. It, think about a time where you know, you decide to rename that plugin instead of going and changing it all over your commands file. You can do this in one stop in common.js, and then you can import it like this into um, any of your other files as and when needed. And then in terms of the commands.js file, which sits under AMD source, um, essentially we have, uh, this is where you're gonna use and interact with the tiny MCE editor. Um, so, for the commands.js file, you have options like add icon, add button, add toggle button. So this allows you to specify where in the editor you want to add the specific plugin or modify the specific command to the plugin. Um, the get setup function um, essentially will fetch required elements like icon, language string, um, and so on and so forth for setting up your overall function. And then the next thing is the handle action. Handle action, as you will see, can be renamed into anything. Um, and, and what it really does is that's where really all the magic happens. It's defining what your plugin is going to do um, at the end of the day. All right. So as we discussed, there are two things that you're going to define in commands.js. The get set up, um, this async function. Um, and I think Andrew mentioned that the tiny MC plugin manager API requires all code to be synchronous, um, which means that you need this. Um, this means that this get set up function was going to fetch your strings and icons that will be used when registering the command. And um, then you'll be able to register the commands for the plugin with tiny MC. Um, and then this handle action function, it defines how buttons and menu items respond. This is, as I said, the magic where um, you define how your plugin is going to work, uh, what it's going to do. And let me actually give you a better example than uh, kind of window.console uh, here. All right. So this example, um, credit goes to Rajneel for his uh, GitHub example on tiny font case. It's a very simple example that I felt like covered everything um, you needed to know about a tiny MCE plugin. Um, the idea is it allows you to allows users to easily change the case of a selected text within the editor. So, for example, um, a toolbar for switching text to uppercase or lowercase. Um, so one toolbar icon over here, it switches it to, um, can you see my mouse pointer actually? Okay, <laughs> um, I didn't wanna just keep saying here. So one toolbar icon over here to switch it to lowercase, the other toolbar icon over here. And the other thing is under this format menu item, you can actually have a sub I or nested menu item with lowercase and uppercase conversion. And what, the reason I also really like this example is because it shows you how much of a pattern it almost becomes to create the core functionality of the plugin. So quick recap, make sure you generate the skeleton code for the plugin um, using um, this sort of recipe YAML. So you have to just basically get started for building TinyMCE font case plugin. Um, there, Moodle has provided you with a plugin skeleton generator, which helps you set up the base code, like all of the files and folders and configurations. And you can set up this base recipe YAML with the plugin name font case, and then the component name following the guidelines tiny font case. Um, once we have the recipe set up, you basically run it through. Um, you run it through this plugin skeleton 
generator to create the initial plugin structure. And after that, we're going to check to make sure the plugin is uh, created in the right location. Should ideally be under Moodle root, uh, lib library, editor, tiny, and you should find the plugins under that. And this is going to give us a good place to get started uh, to add our functionality. So once all of that is said, once you've generated all of that, the next step is to install the plugin. But before installation, um, you can go ahead and compile it to test to make sure that everything is set up com uh, uh, correctly. Follow the guidelines. I think um, Android Slide has a few more detailed guidelines on how to check uh, if compilation works. Um, all right. So the icon itself. Um, one of the most important things about a rich text editor, something that's so visual, I think, is what the icon is, what visually you can see to click uh, for the users. Um, and let's say we wanted to add this specific icon so it appears neatly in the toolbar. So first we take an SVG sort of image and uh, you load it up in your Moodle.com site administration page under plugins and check that the icon is actually showing up under the specific tiny font case here. All right. Once you have that set up, you the goal of this plugin, or let's say we'll break it down into two steps. One, changing it to the toolbar such that we have plugins in our toolbar and then one in the menu bar as a nested menu item. So for the toolbar, the goal is when you select some text and click the lowercase button, it's going to change to lowercase. And if you select, um, let's say, hello world and set it, select the uppercase button, it's going to go all caps and um, set it to uppercase. And the way we're going to do this is in two to three steps, which is adding the code to register the toolbar buttons, adding the code to display these buttons on the toolbar. And then the final thing is to implement a handler to actually change the selected ta case, text case, based on the button that was clicked. Um, and finally, of course, adding icons for lowercase and uppercase buttons based on the SVG we already have. So how do we do this? So this code basically is just a setup for a lowercase button. I will show you the preview of that. Um, I'm not sure if you get a copy of the slides, but this code is actually copyable from here as well. Um, and what it basically does is first, you're going to import a couple of like handy utilities. Uh, one to get the button image and another for retrieving basically localized text um, as get string. And inside, the next thing that we're going to work on is inside the get setup function itself. Um, basically, we fetch the tooltip um, text, which is lowercase title, uh, by calling on get string lowercase on this specific component. Um, and we are this component, again, is imported from what I mentioned earlier, which is um, the common.js, where you can store all of the things in one place so you're not kind of searching for it all the time. And then the the next thing that you're actually looking for is the get button image. Again, you're getting that from the lowercase and component and storing it in as lowercase image. Once we have all of these assets, which is the title and the image is what you really need, we can then register the button. So you can re return it as basically an asynchronous function. Um, and the icon first gets registered. So you do editor UI registry um, It's a specific API. Then you can see that there are several different functions that you can call to play around with how the icon. Um, how the plugin uh, is set up. And here we're setting it up as add icon with the lowercase icon um, and the image as well. And then the same thing with the add button to the toolbar, giving it the lowercase icon and the tooltip text. And, um, and then what we see here is on action, we have this change case, which is what, uh, if you remember earlier, is um, the handle uh, function that I was talking about. So this code here, the change case is really the heart of this plugin. It's actually what changes the selected text to uppercase or lowercase within the editor. So what's basically happening is you have all of your imports and it looks like I left one of the imports in from when I was cleaning it up. But 
you have all of your imports, um, lowercase button name and all of that. And what you're essentially doing is you're getting an instance of the editor and then you're getting two case. Um, so in this case, um, if you click the lowercase button, you want to change it to lowercase. You're passing in the lowercase string. So you can see that we've passed in lowercase string. And in that case, we want our selected text. So for our selected text, we do editor. This is get content and set content, which is a pretty simple UI um, API call, which is editor.selection.getContent. We'll give you the current selected content in, within the editor. And then you have um, the, which will give you the current selected text. Once you have that, you can see which case you want to switch that specific text to. Call on that with a string function to lowercase or to uppercase, and you're all set in order to do that. So in a nutshell, this function is really what powers the text case buttons in the toolbar um, and gives you the ability to switch between um, upper and lowercase. So I've, spoken a lot and basically this code is sort of a summary of how repeatable as i said this would be and the steps are pretty similar to what we did before just basically adding uppercase and lowercase at once um quick rundown uh we start by fetching all the tooltips and icon in this promise.all function we register the icons we add the buttons to the toolbar and then we should be all set up um to use it in tinyMC. so that's kind of in a summary what you need to set it up. And now we take this, so if you remember this sort of three-step process of what you need to do, if we take this and carry it over to the next thing, which is nested menu items, just like toolbar buttons, adding a nested menu item is pretty similar. And this in this case, we're using the menu API call instead of um, calling, sorry, instead of calling on the add icon and uh, add button API. So we'll, first what we're gonna do is register a new menu item um, and we'll give it two sub options specifying that we need sub items, uh, one for lowercase and one for uppercase to make it look something like this visually. Next we'll add the code that actually changes the text. Um, but since we already have change case, we can use that text. Uh, use that piece of code. And finally, we'll assign an icon to the menu item itself over here um, that will pull in, or we can reuse the same SVG icon from the past, up to you. Um, so here. So let's take a look quickly at how this code works. Again, as I said, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward thing once you start doing it over and over again. Um, this thing, um, sort of the main things are, pull in the menu item name icons from the common button. Um, you get your, you know, get button image and get string as your core utility functions that you're going to be using. And then you do a promise.all, which basically uh, loads your necessary icons to get these values um, and lower, uh, both uppercase, lowercase and menu item options. Um, and then finally, you register. Um, I'm, I'm not including the implementation for the toolbar buttons because that's going to go past this page. But finally, for registering um, a menu item, it's going to be slightly different. So for registering a toolbar button, we did editor.ui.registry.add button. But when it's a menu item, when it's something that you can drag, uh, when it's like part of the menu, well, oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> when it's part of the menu item um, over here, you're going to have to specify uh, the specific place that you want it to come from. And once you've done that, it's sort of the same rinse and repeat where you specify the icon that you're pulling in. You um, And in this case, we're pulling it in from CommonJS. You specify the menu item name title. And then you, you mentioned that you have two sub uh, menu items. Uh, with these specific objects, such as menu item, lowercase title, and um, menu item, uppercase title. And the action that happens for both are change case, which again, we're reusing the function that we defined earlier um, over here. 
and this is how it would kind of be set up overall. So the setup here really mirrors what we did with the toolbar button. Um, and the only real difference is, is the add nested menu item for drop down format. Um, but the rest sort of uh, stays the same. Sweet. Um, I hope that kind of showed you how um, kind of setting up a basic editor uh, plugin for TinyMCE is, um, I would say once you get a hang of it, is pretty repeatable process. Um, and yeah, use a lot of the templates that are already existing and sort of make the changes um, from there on. So I think we are almost at the end of time. So I'm going to try to get through a few more things, which is um, why adding plugins to TinyMCE in general. Um, I think... You know, we're all pretty satisfied sometimes with the basic rich text editor, and it's pretty powerful in and of itself. But I, th I think of plugins, especially like these sort of customizable plugins, um, where you can add anything from new buttons to unique features. Like um, I recently saw someone create a highlight plugin um, where they highlighted a piece of text and they were able to make a different gradients of a highlight uh, depending on their use case and accessibility needs and so on and so forth. So um, there's there's different ways and different use needs of your users for your specific experience and making sure that uh, your rich text editor can be as simple as you need it to, to as complex as you need it to is why plugins are really useful. And there's also one more thing that plugins offer is we we offer like the suite of premium plugins. So TinyMC offers over 15 premium plugins for Moodle and um, they're meant to actually help with content creation. But the the bigger reason why I think premium plugins are interesting is because some functionalities are more complex than others. Um, and I'll take the example maybe of power paste and enhanced tables, um, creating a functionality where you, and, and you have to think about it as engineering time and resources and how much time you really have on your hand, um, where are you ready to, you know, put together that entire repository of code, the tree structure and maintain a plugin where the functionality is to copy from a Word document and paste it into an HTML editor and make sure all the formatting is right. Um, that is a pretty, pretty big lift in terms of engineering capabilities. Um, same with enhanced tables and so on and so forth. Um, so that's where I really think the decision for premium plugins comes into play. But with that said, showing off a few premium plugins that might be of interest, including power paste, spell checker, enhanced image editing, enhanced tables, export to PDF, which I think is really valuable. Um, all of these are available today in um, Moodle as premium plugins. And some things that I believe are on the horizon and we're already in talks with the Moodle team about include document converters. So more than just exporting from PDF, like importing from Word document or exporting to a Word document. Um, collaboration features like seeing the revision history, who made the change, um, why did they make that, tracking all of the changes, um, comments and mentions and a lot, lot more collaboration features features to truly give that, uh, let's say, almost Google Docs-like experience to a rich text editor. So yeah, without the more delay, I think questions from anyone? Uh, I've got one for uh, Andrew. So uh, in Moodle 5.0, uh, Eto would be removed. So I'm guessing yes. that would be moved to the uh, plugins directory, we could still be able to use in Moodle 5 or there would yes. be no support for it at all? Um, we will not officially support it, but we you will be able to install it from the plugins database, yes. Okay, um, because I think that will we be still have a few. Time. Yeah, yeah. There, there's still some plugins that are not uh, available for TinyMC. So we still have that option to work in. Yeah. Yeah, and we actually, um, we've been using TinyMCE since about Moodle, uh, well, 1.0, um, because we, for many years, we only removed tiny MCE three in Moodle 2.7, uh, so Moodle 4.1. We've had a very old version of tiny MCE. <laughs> but yeah, you can still use um, Atto in Moodle 
5.0 and up for a while longer if you install it from plugins mm -hmm. database. Uh, David, you're asking, can plugins yeah. modify things uh, other than, than buttons, for example, the behavior of other plugins? Uh, kind of. Um, you cannot modify necessarily their behavior unless they provide that via a configuration option. Um, the way that the Moodle uh, plugin system has been designed for Tiny, uh, you can modify the behavior of other, you can modify the configuration of other plugins. So any plugin which is defined later on can, de uh, can modify the configuration for anything up to that point. At the moment, plugins are loaded um, uh, alphabetically. So later on in the alphabet will happen later. Um, and you can then make changes, yes. So for example, you, uh, you may want, you could create a plugin to change the colors that are available or change options or disable plugins if you want to, or add um, standard plugins, which we have removed. Uh, any other question? Hi, hi everyone. I have a, a question here. Um, we we are using Auto Editor at the moment. We have some custom plugins in there, and we are looking at switching to Tiny MCE. Um, doing the migration of those um plugins to Tiny MCE, would that going to be is that going to be um feasible, or uh, would you recommend to uh, develop a new plugin from scratch, doing what we want to do? We generally recommend um, going from scratch. The reason, the main reason behind that is that Atto was written using YUI um, and doesn't make use of uh, a lot of the AMD features like the string management um, and templates. Um, and it's therefore quite difficult to automatically do so. Uh, you, you would need to take each case on a case by case basis. But gen generally what we found is that it's a good opportunity to update the code to modern standards anyway, because a lot of the plugin, uh, a lot of code standards have changed over the last kind of five to 10 years um, on what, what constitutes good code, um, for example. So unfortunately, there's no automatic way of doing it. And that's largely because of the migration away from YUI. Cool. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I think that's what we have uh, time for. So <clears throat> uh, just before we finish, uh, if uh, any of you would like to help uh, contribute to Moodle Academy, if you have an idea uh, for you where, uh, a webinar or a course that you want to see on Moodle Academy, uh, just let let us know. There's this Get Involved a course where you could you know, post your ideas. And if you want to help us co-create a course or present a webinar on a topic that you think you know others would be interested in, and then again, just let us know. And we are also trying to make Moodle Academy as accessible as possible. Uh, we are trying to make our courses translated into uh, other languages. So if you could help with the uh, translations, uh, just check out the uh, Translate Moodle Academy uh, course uh, on the Moodle Academy uh, site. And uh, yes, just spread the word about Moodle Academy. Uh, when you complete a course, you of course get a badge. And uh, for your educator friends, uh, if you know somebody who is an educator, they might be interested in the Moodle Educator Certification. Uh, so we have the, are you ready for the MEC quiz? Once they take that quiz, uh, then one of our certified uh, Moodle service providers will guide them through the entire certification process. Uh, so with those words, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Marina, for taking your time to you know talk about this topic. And we hope that uh, you found this uh, topic useful. So uh, like mentioned, there's already this course creating uh, TinyMC plugins in Moodle. There's already a course on Moodle Academy and the recording for this particular session would be part of that uh, course as well. So it will form a reference material for our course participants. Uh, you could uh, review the recording there. The slides will also be made available there. And uh, with those words, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you again.